Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Library Commission's weekly online event, our online webinar series that we've been doing for uh, about two years now. In January, will be two years. Um, we cover any activities, anything that may be of interest to Nebraska librarians. We have commission staff that do sessions, and we have guest speakers that come in, as we have today. Uh, we do these sessions every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. They are recorded though, so if you are unable to attend any of these live sessions, you can always watch one of our many archive sessions, which are available right here on our website. There's a link on our uh, main page. Oh, we have a list of all the archive sessions we've ever done in the whole uh, two years of Encompass Live. This morning, we have a couple librarians from up, eh, Omaha direction. Uh, Gordon Wyant from Bellevue Public Library and Lindsay Tamsu from La Vista are going to talk to us today about graphic novels for uh, libraries. So I am going to hand over presentation capabilities to you, Gordon, and you can share your screen. Okay. Okay. Um, yep, go ahead. Right, there you go. Right. Yep, we're seeing it. Okay, and go ahead, take it away. Okay. Well, um, as she said, I'm Gordon Wyant from Bellevue Public Library, and this is a clever title with a pun involving the word graphic, a presentation without a real title because I'm a bad person, and I stalled <laughs> way too long to come up with a title about the history of graphic novels. It's not going to be um, entirely accurate. Um, the history of graphic novels is, is um, very... Um, rich and diverse and if uh, anybody doesn't like the little short you know history that we have here you can pester Lindsay Tomsu she has she wrote a 400 page tome on the subject and she can send that to you really <laughs> wow okay good job we'll get started <laughs> all right hopefully we'll get started here there. Um, there are a few definitions. A really great one is by Scott McCloud. He says, juxtaposed pictorial and other images in deliberate sequence intended to convey information and or produce an aesthetic response in the viewer, which is a great definition, but it's kind of long-winded and isn't really, you know, succinct enough for, for our purposes. So we'll just use a story whose narrative is conveyed by a marriage of sequenced images and words. Okay, now that can lead to a couple things. Comic book, comic strip, graphic novel, all kinds of things. So just a quick thing. Comic, comic book, comics in general actually are going to follow the same basic pattern. They will start in the, in the top right, or top left, excuse me, and each frame will follow, you know, you for, uh, excuse me, from left to right and down. And then same with the word bubbles. Of course, if it's manga, it's reversed. So let me do it that way. Manga, of course, being Japanese comics, manhwa, things like that. We'll talk about those in a bit. Um, the other types of comics that you might run into, the comic strip is a line or two of panels that tell a short story through the use of sequential images and words. These are like Garfield, Calvin Hobbes, stuff like that. Comic book is generally a pamphlet or magazine sized book and the narrative is, is relayed to the reader through sequential images and words. You're going to hear that a lot, sequential images and words. So. Um, <laughs> graphic novel is a novel whose narrative is made up of sequential images and words. Um, oftentimes it is a collected um, a collection of a series of comic books in one big hardbound if they're happy and not going to let you waste thirty dollars a hardbound copy of it and if they're terrible it's going to be a terrible terrible bound paperback but anyway that's uh, that's my own frustration and manga is a catch-all word that encompasses graphic novels which stylistically resemble Japanese comics and it's important to remember with manga, graphic novels, comics in general, that um, it is not a genre, it is a medium. There are tons of genres within the medium. So you've got sci-fi, you've got romance, you've got history, you've got all kinds of stuff. It's just like, um, just like normal novels, just with, um, excuse me, with um, the same, you know, presented in the same medium. Here's just an example of a comic strip. I found this through a... Uh, little website lets you make your own comic um, just to kind of show you it's one little strip and there's all that stuff and he's a frog um, 
Okay. <laughs> and this is a page out of a comic. This is from Batgirl number 50. You can see it's, you know, you've got, you start up here and go through here and here and here and here. And the images kind of lead you down through the, um, the progression of the narrative. Um, so instead of one strip, it's a little more complicated. Now we'll get to the actual history. Rough and reasonably accurate history of graphic novels. And you've got a bunch, it's divided into a bunch of different ages, proto-comics and the platinum age. This is going to be from the late 19th century to 1938, and it's really going to be um, um, typified by like uh, comic strips and newspapers. The golden age, this is when we have the advent of the superhero. It's from 1938 to late 1940s. This is where comics start to go mainstream. In the Silver Age is the 40s to 1970s. There's more oversight and regulations that change the content of the comics and in some cases make them a lot worse, but actually make it possible for the comics as we know them today. And 1970s to 1980s is known as the Bronze Age. Um, this is where super, superheroes are shown to just be human. They're mortal. They make mistakes. They do stupid things. They you know, are, have weaknesses. And real world social issues find purchase in comics. And the modern age is the 1980s to current. There's more dark storylines that mature, explore mature themes and um, more literary merit kind of stuff. We have the rise of the anti-hero. So we'll start with proto-comics in the Platinum Age. And the first big single, big comic that really, really made it, made it big. And there's a few, you know, um, people that might, might can have a, a contest with this. But uh, the single panel comic by Richard Occult featuring the Yellow Kid, which is pictured here, it was not very PC, um, but, uh, but it was the standard thing. And um, generally you'd have this, this is the Yellow Kid here, you'd have what he's saying generally pasted onto his little, his shirt, his night shirt or whatever it is he wears. It was very, very popular. Um, it was collected in 1897 as the first proto-comic. Um, which is, you know, before comic books or comic books, it's basically a book with these little single panel comics shoved in there called The Yellow Kid and McFadden Flats. McFadden Flats, excuse me. After that got really popular, newspapers started printing actual comic strips. And Mutt and Jeff is the first one by Bud Fisher. Here's Mutt and Jeff right here. Um, comic strip becomes very popular in magazines and newspapers. Um, Mutt and Jeff is so popular that tons of... Um, uh, imitators pop up all over the place. And the basic panel to panel narrative progression and dialogue trappings are developed. Here's a good example of um, Sneaky and Ignatz. We've got Sneaky telling Ignatz that uh, he shouldn't hook his tail like that because if he does, it'll catch on something and it'll become unraveled, which happens on the bottom here, um, which I think is pretty funny, but hey, that's me. <laughs> and the comic book is born in 1933 when Famous Phonies is published which is actually, um, it was put together by a small press for Woolworth store, if I'm remembering correctly, and uh, just kind of sold at the cash registers for 10 cents, as you can see. Um, it was ridiculously popular. They didn't expect it to be as popular as it was. And uh, so they just kept making more and more and more. Um, and then the publishing industry kind of caught on and started doing their own. Became cheap and disposable entertainment. They usually featured multiple storylines and episodic comics from different artists, different stories. It wasn't just like one story the whole way through. Um, and uh, basically, you know, these things launched an entirely new American medium, which brings us to the Golden Age. Who's that guy in the pajamas? Well, it's Superman, of course. Action Comics is released in June 1938, and this completely changes comic books forever. We, find, we finally get superheroes and stuff. By the early 1940s, comic books are completely filled with them. We've got the Human Torch and Toro and Submariner hanging out down there with his bulging biceps. And uh, Wonder Woman. And um, when the war starts, actually slightly before the war starts, um, comic book characters start fighting the war. Um, you see you have Captain America here punching Hitler. The really interesting thing about this was... Um, that um, this was this comic was actually published before it was really popular about America going into the war, we're still being isolationist. But um, the um, the creators were very very uh, passionate about um, 
what Hitler was doing and that things needed to change. And so Captain America is beating him up. And there's Bucky hanging out there. Um, anyway, <laughs> they take part in the war effort. And uh, the troops carry them throughout the, the war. Here, here you have Green Lantern. He's really big and big Nazis and the world's on fire. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but uh, the troops carried him around because they're cheap and portable and, and disposable. They can just drop them somewhere. Here we have Wonder Woman diving into a trench of Nazis with her horse. Um, and Superman punching a tank. So basically, comics got all over Europe and, um, and the, the Pacific arena that way by the troops carrying them around, which will factor in greatly when we get to other stuff. But anyway, um, after um, World War II and Hiroshima and everything, Hushers in what's called the Atomic Age of the Golden Age which is where superhero popularity kind of wanes a bit. They're still out there, still doing stuff. It's just not quite as, pop, as popular. And um, the content reflect the fears and concerns of atomic power. I mean, everybody saw what happened to Hiroshima, and um, we're kind of reeling from the, the power we've unleashed. And, and so the, the media reflects that. Um, so we've got you know, Superman covering an atom bomb test. And um, popularity of horror crime comic book store. Um, just people want something that's a little more true to life, I guess. And so they have these crime stories and, you know, Tales from the Crypt. This is where EC becomes a huge force with Tales from the Crypt and all their crime stuff. And then Frederick Wortham acts like a douche. Really, um, this guy isn't so terribly deplorable. He just kind of made a bit of a miscalculation. He was a German immigrant psychologist. He helped to improve that patient's environment impacts their mental state. He was a very vocal and integral part of the effort to remove school desegregation. So really, he's not a bad guy at all. But he basically convinced a whole bunch of concerned mothers and parents that comic books are destroying their children. He publishes Horror in the Nursery and the Psychopathology of Comic Books, which prompts Canada to ban the publication of crime comic books. And comic book earnings are publicized in Time Magazine. Here you have kids sadly burning their comic books. Uh, collectors cry over that every day. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> stuff just got Sad. <laughs> Frederick Wortham publishes The Seduction of the Innocent. And this is the, this is the um, rallying point for everybody who thinks that comic books are terrible. Um, this sparks congressional hearings on juvenile delinquency, and they firmly place the blames on the comics, you know, instead of the fact that there was a boom in, in, uh, in birth rates, and whenever you have a boom in birth rates, you've got a boom in you know, everything that goes along with it. So, but they just blamed it on comics. This, um, every, gener every decade, I think, really has the thing that they blame the, uh, the, um, how the world's going to, to poop. Um, you know, I mean, it was, gra or it was comic books back then, it, then it became um, music, and then it became video games, so it just kind of changed. But the Comics Code Authority is created as a result of this. When here you have the little badge that they use. It's created by Max Gaines of EC and industry leaders. Um, their original intent was to fight outside censorship by, um, by regulating themselves. Um, Max Gaines was a very um, vocal um, proponent of, um, of non-censorship and um, intellectual freedoms. And uh, unfortunately, this beast turned into something much more than he could handle. And the strict codes that came out regarding what published essentially ran E.C. out of business. Because they could have no violence, gore, or sexuality. Authority figures are sacrosanct, and good will always triumph. And no vampires, werewolves, ghouls, or zombies. <laughs> I put this in here so I could have a bit of... Water. Okay. <laughs> Why, well, yes, anime person with a large pencil. I think it is a good time to talk about manga. Okay, there's really no way to talk about graphic novels currently with a, any reasonably modern thing without talking about manga because it has had a very big impact on modern 
comics and graphic novels. Um, basically, U.S. occupation. Remember when I said that comics were used as a cheap and disposable form of entertainment? Well, U.S. occupation brings those comics to, J to Japan, and they also start playing a lot of Disney films over there. Um, a lot in, in hand with uh, reconstruction and everybody, you know, thinking about new ways of rebuilding and 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 art in new ways really sparks an explosion of artistic endeavor. And we see people like Osama Tezuka and the early manga artists are heavily influenced by the comics and the Disney animation is brought over through occupation. Shin Takarajima by Osama Tezuka is the first. Um, really the first, it's really nailed as the, the first manga. It's essentially a, a um, version of uh, Treasure Island and uh, it completely, everybody's amazed by it over there and it sparks a huge revolution. And um, his, uh, Tezuka's subsequent releases like Kimba the White Lion and if you're seeing a similarity to The Lion King and if you've ever seen the uh, Kimba the White Lion, you'll realize that Disney just basically stole it. But that's okay because, you know. Well, that's what they, that's what they do generally. Yes, they borrow. <laughs> but anyway, and then Astro Boy, and you can see they've really, he's really established the basic things. Rose of Versailles here, the big eyes with the eye shine, the, the rather, you know, skinny bodies, things like that. Um, as a result of this, many monthly magazines are published with serialized um, storylines. I couldn't find a good picture of one of the original ones, so this is one from, I think, I don't know, mid-90s over in Japan. But um, it's basically, if you imagine um, the Shonen Jump, which is published in America, um, it's just like that. So you've got a bunch of different uh, storylines that are continuing in each issue. and. Uh, but it was just like that, and except older print and you know not as pretty. Um, <laughs> but uh, the shonen and shoujo genres come, become defined. Shonen is uh, more actiony; it's usually for uh, teen boys, and shoujo is is uh, more romance and and character driven. It's more uh, it's generally read by by girls. In 1963, Shitara Ishimura's Cyborg 009 starts a trend of superhuman teams which are really, really big and continue to be big in Japan. This would be stuff like uh, the Power Rangers, um, if you remember those from not too long ago. Okay, into the breach. In 1968, Gona Guy, which is this little guy right here with this little getter robo robot, which we'll talk about in a little while, um, <laughs> he uh, publishes Shameless School, which uh, completely changes the manga world. Parents and women's groups and PTAs across Japan really don't like its scandalous content. Basically, it's it's um, it's a well here, there you go. <laughs> this is Shameless School, and uh, it's just basically you know a school, and uh, you've got teen boys you know talking about you know girls being cute, girls running around and at beaches with with swimsuits on, things like that. Um, basically, it's just it was humor that um, any teen boy of any era would identify with. And uh, it's hugely popular, but the parents in the women's group of PTA really, really kind of boost its popularity inadvertently by opposing it so much. Uh, the conflict reaches its peak with the last issue of Shameless School, where he's just tired of all the, um, uh, the guy is tired of all the, the, the protests and everybody complaining about it, that, um, he kind of makes a point of he basically what he does is he just kills brutally, brutally and bloodily kills off every single teacher and character in the series in a terrible, horrible, like disgusting massacre. Um, the point being that people have less problem with that than um, boys laughing at, at girls in skirts and um, bikinis. So, but anyway, the popularity wins through. And um, and it becomes the concept of fan service is born, which is basically a um, cultural thing in um, Japanese manga, where you'll have like um, a breeze will blow up, and um, you'll see a little bit of a girl's panties or something like that. It's basically fan service is the term because a lot of fans are guys, and that's something they want to see. So service to fans. But anyway. 
the second generation, everything that's come before that has creates everything to come after it, obviously. Ryoka Akita in the year 24 group changed the face of shoujo and developed the first shonen ai manga. Uh, the year 24 group was a group of, uh, of women um, writers and artists that made a, a bunch of shoujo that were um, very successful and, um, and, and whatever. And shonen ai is, um, it's a type of, um, oh god, I just lost my Okay, Shonen and I is um, I'm I'm losing my words here. I'm sorry, it's still early for me. <laughs> Shonen and I is a a version of um, a romance that's a, it's a non-sexual romance between two boys, which becomes very popular in Japan, and uh, it's not something that and it's popular in America. It's something that's not uh, it's not generally read by gay men, gay teens, gay boy teens is generally read by women. And there's a lot of interesting um, um, psychological papers that talk about why that's so popular as opposed to, you know, your standard guy and girl romance. But I'm not going to go into that because that's a presentation. Completely other thing. We could talk about that for hours. Oh, anyway, yes. <laughs> Kazuo Kalite's Lone Wolf and Cub elevates manga to the level of historical art. Um, this is an amazing story. You can still get it. I definitely suggest you get it for your teen collection if you can. It is, it's amazing. Um, it's essentially, um, you know, this uh, guy right here, Lone Wolf, he's a ronin, which is a masterless samurai, and, uh, and a little orphaned child here who uh, is actually um, the, I don't know, but anyway, he's, it's basically these two running around, and uh, the child grows up, and it's in the, the, near the end of the feudal era of Japan. And, um, and it's, it's very accurate historically and artistically. It's amazing story-wise. It's, it's incredible. So that really you know, bumps up the, uh, the ante for, for uh, serious artists. Going to guys, get a robo starts the mecha subgenre. This is, mecha is basically big robot, you know, like Voltron, uh, Robotech, things like that. Although slightly different than Robotech, but but basically, you know, the, the giant robots that is always so popular. Um, and Leiji Matsumoto revolutionizes manga space opera with titles like Captain Harlock and Galaxy Express 009. Um, and Akira by Katsuhiro Otomo sets the stage for upcoming near future dystopian manga. And we'll be talking about this again because this is huge in uh, in manga in general and the graphic novel. Um, thing. And the New Bloods take over the world. By 1990, manga is a global force, and Clamp explodes onto the scene with Card Captor Sakura, Magic Knight Ray Earth, X1999, and a bunch of others. They're hugely, hugely, hugely popular. Um, you over here, they're hugely popular, except they're kind of jerks. Um, about 2000, they uh, were so happy with what they did that they decided to take a sabbatical and left all their stuff unfinished and just started publishing art books. They still haven't finished X1999, much to the chagrin of all of my teens. Uh, <laughs> but, but anyway, the uh, point is, is that they become hugely successful. And, um, and a lot of their, um, their artistic stylings prompt um, a lot of, of, of new, new um, artists and stuff. Anyway, Rumiko Takahashi finds global success with Rana Half and Inuyasha, eventually becoming the richest woman in Japan. Fruits Basket by Natsuki Pagai. Really? I had, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, she's the richest woman in Japan. <laughs> and Fruits Basket by Natsuki Takaya becomes one of the most successful manga ever. Um, and in 2006, Masashi Kishimoto's Naruto, everybody knows about Naruto, uh, can't get away from it, <laughs> makes up to 10% of all manga sales which really isn't all that impressive until you think about, by 2007, manga publications make over $3.5 billion annually. And that's just in Japan. So 10% of that's a pretty hefty chunk. <laughs> but anyway. So oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's getting all over the place. And so we'll get back to American comics and talk about the Silver Age. Okay, we have the rebirth of the superhero as a result of the Comics Code Authority. They no longer, you know, can do crime stuff, horror films, or horror, horror comics, rather. 
so they've got to go to something else. And so they went back to superheroes. And in order to do that, they um, they made a uh, a makeover of the Flash. And uh, his the fiscal success of the new Flash was so huge that it prompted other makeovers. Oh, other makeovers. Excuse me, I'm having a hard time talking. And the comics get Staniceized. Stan Lee and Jack Kirby come in as creative talent for Marvel Comics and completely change the face of comics as we know it. Um, the Fantastic Four has introduced their, char their characters with human flaws and human concerns. Um, Reed Richards and and his his wife, the Invisible Woman, have have problems with their their marriage. The thing is, well, he's a big rock thing, which prompts all kinds of trouble with his his uh, his interactions with other people. And uh, so basically, just human characters. And the other big thing about this is that this first time, villains have superpowers as well. Before this, they were just like mob bosses or or um, or Nazis or you know stuff like that. They didn't have powers of their own. And uh, you know, we see like you know, characters with with normal stuff going on, like Spider-Man and and the X-Men, which is actually there's a, another. You can talk about the uh, the socio and and um, psychological um, backings of the X Men, who are you know um, outcasts and and they're different from everybody else, yet they're protecting everybody else and everything. But anyway, you've got Magneto here, who has superpowers of his own, which is just illustrating the villains having powers of their own. Um, alongside these things, the happenings in 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 the um, that's the word I'm looking for, the uh, legit comics. You have the underground comics, which are published by independent presses that ignore the rules of the Comics Code Authority. And up here within Zap Comics, they've got their little, their Comics Code Authority um, lampoon here going on here. And it dealt with current socio-political issues, including sex, drugs, war protests. And, um, and the success of these underground comics really opens the door for the fall of the CCA. Um, Zap Comics is one of the big ones, the major ones. It's where we get the Keep On Trucking guy, and uh, yeah, it's hugely popular. But anyway, Spider-Man, Stan Lee, and the government versus drugs and the Comics Code Authority. In 1971, Health, Education, and Welfare asked Stan Lee to create a comic book story about drugs, seeing how much of an impact that comics were having in with the uh, children. They really wanted to to get out there and, and you know get some anti-drug information into something they're actually going to read. So Stan accepts this and makes something. The CCA declares it inappropriate for publishing because of the drugs involved. Um, Marvel decides to publish it anyway. And here you have it. Sounds the CCA approval. And it is hugely, hugely successful. Um, the public support is massive. The fiscal success is, is, is great. And so, you know, that kind of paves the way for, for people wanted to do it anyway. So the CCA loosens the reins a bit. They revise the regulations after Spidey's anti-drug story, and it opens the door for more socially relevant stories. Um, heroes with a harder edge, like where, or Wolverine here. Um, here we see Green Arrow's Green Arrow sidekick is a heroin junkie, and um, we have the crack herd around the world, which is where the Green Goblin snaps the neck of Gwen Stacy, Spider-Man's. Um, Paramour. Um, <laughs> and uh, so with these um, more mature, more socially relevant stories to things that are going on, um, comics really kind of start to see a revolution. But even with that, you can see they've laced in the rain so much that this is still approved by the Comics Code Authority. Um, the Comics Code Authority isn't as big a thing as it, it once was. Um, you can find lots of comics that don't have the CCA. It still exists. You'll still find some that do have it on there, but it's not a big deal anymore. Uh, comic book stores and uh, bookstores will carry them regardless of whether they have that little badge. And we have the first graphic novel. Um, 1978, Will Eisner's Contract with God is published. It's basically a bunch of um, um, short stories written in a comic format about um, a group of people living in a tenement in New York. And it's written uh, in, for an adult audience, and it showed that the format could be used for serious literature. 
it's it's very very interesting and very good. And if you have an adult um, graphic novel section in your library, I definitely suggest trying to get a copy of it. Oh no, I forgot to do that. Uh, it's all broken. Anyway, he's saying he wants to come back. Comics Code Authority is saying he can. He says, oh, yay. And now he's going to go stock Bella some more and flies off. <laughs> All right. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, the modern age is developed. Okay, this is where storylines become, um, and the art becomes darker, and you have a lot more artists striving for more artistic merit, uh, more, more realistic images, um, not just things that are more two-dimensional. Like here's a, a good example where you have Wolverine here, who's, you know, the, the, the anti-hero as far as um, um, comics go. Um, you can see that there's really he's got crow's feet, he's lots of shading hair. It's it's more realistic. I mean, other than the fact that he's got giant things coming out of his his arms. But anyway, and the horror themes make a comeback. So you get people like the you know the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, which um, you have the cartoon wasn't was kind of chintzy and fun for everybody, but the um, the original Eastman and Laird comics were incredibly gritty, very brutal, um, lots of blood everywhere, dismemberment. Um, they did not shy away from killing people, um, so they actually used their weapons, whereas in the comics they just kind of had them for show. Um, and of course, you have. Um, Darker themes here with the daredevils. Um, once lover is not trying to kill him, and uh, and Alan Moore's the Swamp Thing um, is he redoes the Swamp Thing in a more horror fashion, and uh, it's very successful and great. But anyway, we have the year of the graphic novel in 1986 and 87, and this sees a publisher publication of three really really big graphic novels that really solidify the graphic novel stage. We have the Dark Knight Returns by Frank Miller, which is an incredibly cynical and intelligent critique of society, media, and politics in the Reagan era, and is probably my favorite comic ever. Um, we have Mouse, A Survival's Tale by Art Spiegelman, which is um, it's striking and very, very accessible images and narrative about the Holocaust from the perspective of you've got these mice that are, are supposed to be the Jewish people. and um, cats that are supposed to be the Nazis. And um, this gains the attention of non-comic book readers. And in fact, it's so great that eventually, in 1992, it wins the Pulitzer Prize. Um, and that's incredible. And Watchmen by Alan Moore and Dave Gibbon. This is a really in-depth and, and complex deconstruction of the superhero, as well as the dynamics of power and life in a post-Hiroshima world. And that wins the, the Hugo in 1988. Uh, these titles move the medium from comic book shops to mainstream American bookstores, which is a huge leap. And uh, graphic novels are now seen as valid and profitable medium by publishing houses, which means we get a whole bunch more. And the manga invasion begins. As they borrowed from us, we now borrow from them, especially if your name is Walt Disney. Um, TV shows Voltron and Robotech capture the minds of children in 1984 and 85. Um, Ninja High School by Brian, Ben Dunn and Dynamo Joe by Doug Rice um, become the first real um, original English language manga comic books and are not exactly widely available in comic book stores, but they're not exactly rare in comic book stores either. Um, in 1988, we find, oh, there's Dynamo Joe. Sorry, I forgot I had a picture of that. In 1988, uh, Akira is published in America and uh, really, really solidifies manga's hold in America um, because everybody loves it. It's, it's, uh, it's a, um, a pan genre kind of, of success. Uh, you got the science fiction guys liking it. You got the, uh, the, um, the fantasy guys liking it. Everybody is really enjoying it. And, uh, and that really really opens the door for, for other manga to come across from, from Japan, other original English language stuff to be published in the manga style. Um, oop, I forgot about stuff. In 1993, Viz Media released its first OAL manga in uh, the format that we know and love, which is the little like paperbacks. OAL is original English language. This means it's, it's a um, 
a comic that is originally written and and colored and drawn in in English, but it's it's using the manga um, styles. Um, by 2008, the manga industry, the American manga industry, excuse me, makes 175 million dollars in annual sales, which is pretty big. Graphic novels start to gain legitimacy. In the early 1990s, critically acclaimed collections such as Neil Gaiman's Sandman start finding place in libraries. And graphic novels continue to win library awards and praise. As I mentioned, Mouse wins the Pulitzer Prize in 1992. Palestine by Joe Sasho wins the American Book Award in 1996. Jimmy Corrigan, smartest kid on earth, wins The Guardian in 2001. And Persepolis, story of a childhood, wins the Alex in 2004. To Dance, a ballerina's graphic novel, which is really, really cool, um, is a, a Siebert Award Honor Book in 2007. And American Born Chinese Wins the Prince in 2007. So graphic novels are pretty solidly um, established as a, a legitimate format and, uh, and, and as a literary force. And the graphic novels are for kids, too. By the mid-1900s, the graphic novels for children start being published. Um, whoops. And librarians and media specialists you know, start touting, or I should change that to uh, school librarian, shouldn't I? But anyway, um, I tout the benefits of graphic novels for reluctant readers, visually dependent, non-visual learners, and ESL students. Um, in 1995, the first volume of Jeff Smith's Bone, uh, from Boneville, is released. Um, this is huge. It's popular from, you know, little kids on. You've got kids who can't read, who like to look through it and can follow the pictures, what's happening, and they love it. Uh, teens love it. Adults love it. It's just amazing. And the success of, of, these, of these early all ages and children's graphic novels really opens the door for more. So we get things like Scary Godmother, Cardcaptor Sakura, which is the American version of the Cardcaptor Sakura by Clamp. Um, Baby Mouse, everybody loves Baby Mouse. Pinky and Stinky, which is amazing. I love that one. Magic Pickle, which everyone should recognize. And Lunch Lady, which is a lot of fun. Um, and graphic novels start being used as teaching tools. Uh, librarians and school librarians tout the, the learning and teaching benefits of graphic novels. And uh, we've got biographies. Here's a good example of that. Nonfiction. Um, study guides which uh, we have these in my library and I can't keep them on the shelf, which is pretty amazing. Um, classic or Phonics Aids, Classics, and Shakespeare are all published in graphic novel format and are very successful and are great at reaching the people that might not want to study or have problems with, with uh, phonics and, and all kinds of stuff. Oh, and here's the first graphic novel. You now have uh, uh, graphic novels that are basically like um, I can read books for graphic novels. Just very big frames. I wish I could get a picture of the inside of one of these. Very big frames, big print, um, very simple. Usually has arrows showing you how to read, where to go. Um, they're very cute little things like uh, like this one. If, if I remember correctly, is she's got a little scooter and she rides it around, uh, and so it's a lot of fun. And uh, there's no like big crisis or anything in the storyline. It's just a basic how to read, essentially, except for graphic novels. And these things really, you know, graphic novels at this point are, are all age groups, all, as I said in the beginning, it's a, it's a medium, not a genre. So you've got all genres represented. You've got all different interests represented. It's, it's, uh, and it's, you've got your, your fluff graphic novels as well as your, you know, highbrow, graphic novels with literary merit, such as uh, Blankets, which is up here. You've got little people from Blankets. Um, but anyway, um, but I think that's the end of it. So if anybody has um, any questions or anything, I would, uh, I can totally answer those, or, or Lindsay can answer them for you, or whatever. Uh. Back to begin. <laughs> Is, does anybody have any questions? If you do, you can um, go ahead and type them into the questions section there or just say, hey, I have one question, but I want to use my microphone and I can unmute you and you can go ahead and do that. We did not get any questions during the presentation.
good. So well, either that means either I did a decent job or I did a decent job of putting everybody to sleep. <laughs> no, they were totally enthralled with the topic. I I thought it was very interesting. I hadn't I I've been reading comics and graphic novels well, since I was a kid, but never knew um, the whole history of everything. So it's very interesting to learn. Um, do have a question from my librarians here at, uh, on the staff here at the Library Commission. Um, if you wanted to do a recommendation, what would be the first f five graphic novels that you would recommend librarians would buy if they were starting up a collection for the first time? Well, that would really depend on the age group. Um, uh, true, yes. So um, I think for kids, my first suggestions would be um, Baby Mouse, uh, mm -hmm. Munch Lady. Um, let's see, what else is hugely popular? Um, they have, um, let's see, there's a, there's a good and short um, OEL manga series that Tokyo Pop published called um, Peach Fuzz, which is about a girl and her pet ferret. And the pet ferret is, believes that she's a princess of some sort. Um, and it's, <laughs> that the it's girl is or that the ferret's a princess? The, the ferret believes oh. it's a princess. Okay. And uh, and the kids really like that. Let's mm -hmm. see, that's three. Um, let's see, uh, Magic Pickle, of course, is very mm -hmm. very popular. Um, I'm trying to think of another one that that, that Alice really loves back there. Um, the what now? Oh, Lindsay's got something. <laughs> okay, what is it? Okay, Lindsay says her library has had very. Soon big success with Twisted Journeys for kids. Um, it's like a horror choose your own adventure kind of thing. Oh, nice. Um, which reminds me, a great graphic novel to have um, is Meanwhile, which is recently published, hmm. which is a great kind of choose your own adventure kind of thing. The format mm -hmm. is really cool. Um, it's, there's a ridiculous amount of possibilities you can have. And it all starts with your decision to decide between you having vanilla ice cream or chocolate ice cream. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> Um, and that's, that's really, everybody likes that, but it's great mm -hmm. for kids. Um, for teens, uh, the first four that I would definitely get would be um, uh, Volume 1 of Sandman. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, any, and uh, they've got these big collections that are very expensive. They run about, probably about $80 with a uh, uh, like DWI or, or Ingram discount, but they're totally worth it. Um, I've had them for years now, and I've never once had to send them to Matt. So the binding's mm. really good. It's totally worth it. And um, that's good, yeah, because getting them that way better than all the individual comics that last a lot longer. Oh, yeah. yeah. So definitely Sandman. Um, I would get some, definitely get Bone. Um, I would get some, you know, X-Men or, or Spider-Man, you know, one of those comics, just your general, general um, uh, superhero comics that are, that are popular. And really, any of those would do well. Daredevil, X Men, Spider Man, really any of those. Um, mm -hmm. Beyond that, there's. Uh, I kind of feel that blankets is really, really important for uh, to have as a, a teen. It's it's a uh, it's a big it's a very big graphic novel, but it's a great exploration of um, of young love and uh, you know from a, a teen's perspective in a very um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, restrictive household. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's very good, but um, there there is um, some sexual content in that. There's no like, I don't remember there being any like full frontal nudity or anything like that. But there is <laughs> mm -hmm. instance of sex happening, so you might need to look at at um, your community and what is acceptable in that within that community, mm -hmm. um, what you can get away with, really. Um, I tend to push the envelope an awful lot in my collection because we don't have an adult graphic novel collection, but if you do, oh. you, one, you might want to have an adult area. Um, kind of the same with Sandman, actually. Um, let's see. You might want to pick up the 9-11 um, the Commission report in the graphic format. Um, kids use that for... Um, reports an awful lot, and, mm -hmm. uh, and it's a very interesting way of presenting that information. And, and oh, yeah. It's, it's very good. Um, let's see what else. Um, Pride of Baghdad, I would definitely suggest. It's absolutely amazing. Of course, you have to have the Prince winner of uh, um, American Born Chinese. You do need to have that. Mm -hmm. um, really, there's there's way too many suggestions. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, Watchmen would be a great one to have. Um, a lot of it is, you know, talk to your 
whoever you're thinking of buying for, whether it's the kids, teens, or adults, and see what yeah. they might already be interested in. You know, just like that any other really um, yeah, collection development. Yeah. Um, one of the more domestic ones that you should totally have on the, the superhero side is Runaways. Mm -hmm. um, that's probably one of the most popular superhero kind of groups for the, the, the teen session. They really love them. Um, but yes, just kind of talk with, with uh, the people who you're looking to, to help with. If you have a teen advisory board, talk with them. Um, you can generally, if you don't have a, a graphic novel collection already, um, you can generally figure out from your normals, the one, your, your you know, normal attendees to programs, things like that, the, the teams and the kids and adults who are your, you know, graphic novel readers. Mm -hmm. um, and talk with them about it. And as with anything, you know, well, not necessarily everything, but but do re do some research first. Look at some reviews. If you can, read the graphic novel before you add it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, interlibrary loan it. Go to a Borders and just hang out. You know, do whatever and and just read through the stuff. Um, with the uh, for adults, there's a lot of stuff that that is really really good. That you know, definitely. You should look into, and uh, the tough thing with adults and, and the teen collections is there there is a um, there is a big overlap between the interests, so it's kind of hard to. But you with that you can do things like with the adult section you could do um, the Love and Rocket series, which is really good. Um, let's see what's another good one? Um, uh, the um, uh, Walking Dead would be a great one for older teens and uh, and an adult collection, especially with the AMC series. Oh yeah, <laughs> you know, it's definitely a good one to go with. They're gonna be asking uh, for that if you don't already have it. <laughs> oh yeah, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. they they definitely will. Um, and um, there's just quite a few that that are are really great for adults. Um, you want to look at um, a lot of Alan Moore's recent stuff um, is very adult. Um, he did an incredible um, deconstruction of uh, the, char the female characters from uh, various, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for, like fairy tales and especially Disney stuff called, um, um, oh geez, what is this called? Um, um, oh, I totally forgot what it's called. Oh, I'm an idiot. Um, <laughs> What do you say? Yeah, um, I don't know. I, I'm sorry. I'll try to, to think of it and send an email out or whatever if people are interested. But um, but it's a really interesting uh, deconstruction of, of the psychology and sexuality of, of, of these girls, huh. um, like Alice in Wonderland. And, um, and oh, I can't remember some of the others. I read it a while ago when it, it was published. And I can't put it in my team collection, so I, I don't. <laughs> it, it, is a, it is a very adult book, um, but it is very beautifully done and very um, um, well put together. Let me actually, let me just try to see if I can find that. Um, um, we'll do a quick Google search. Um, Alan Moore. Um, yeah, it's two O's. <laughs> or, uh, yeah, that's it. Lost Girls. There we go. Um, which you can see Alan Moore, who looks like, and his, his wife, well, not exactly wife, who uh, wrote it with, and you can, mm -hmm. he looks like a total homeless person. Or <laughs> um, but Lost oh, Girls okay. is what it's called. And there's a, a picture. I don't know if I'm still broadcasting. Yes, you are. Yep, we see it. Right, yep. Very good. Um, and, uh, and here's just an example of, 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 you know, the inside there. Hmm. Looking even more like a homeless person in the background. But uh, <laughs> it's, it's a really, really amazing thing. I would definitely suggest that for, hmm. for an adult section. Um, but there's quite cool. a few out there that are really great. And um, mm -hmm. see, I'm trying to look at my personal collection here and see if I have anything I can suggest. But uh, I've got mostly teen stuff, other than the Love and Rockets. So, um, mm -hmm. but uh, but really, as as Krista mentioned, you want to you want to talk with your patrons, and um, and they'll give you a general idea of what what you need to get. Mm -hmm. so. um, I have another question about cataloging of these uh, the graphic novels um, by subject or format. Or both, I guess, might be an option. Um, that's actually a common question, and a lot of libraries do it in different ways. If you go by um, Dewey, they're going to end up in like 741 point something or other, and um, and um, 
you know, and that's fine if people know where to find it. Um, if you have a large enough collection, um, you can try to do subject and, and genre headings and, and things like that. Um, I think um, uh, my budget and space restrictions mean I, I don't really have a large enough collection for that. Mm. I have a decently large collection, but not large enough to divide it into that. Um, so what we do is we, uh, we divide them up into children's and young adults. Um, and then they're all tossed kind of in the same area. They're not put, they're not filed with the nonfiction, so they don't have the, the 741, the seven, yeah, they don't have that designation. Um, they're just like young adult graphic novels or juvenile graphic novels. Um, I do separate my manga from the graphic novels and domestic comics, um, just because the manga collection is, is big enough, it's about the same size as my graphic novels and domestic. Uh, graphic novels collection, and uh, it's just good to have them separated because it makes it easier for, you know, people who are looking for specifically manga or people who are looking for, say, you know, the Sandman books, you know, they know where to go. They're in the same yeah. areas, but they're separated on different display racks. Mm -hmm. um, that's how we do it. Really, it depends on your library and what works best for you and how large your collection is. Um, so. Um, if you have a big enough collection to divide it into genre, that'd be really, really cool. <laughs> my collection was big enough, and I had enough space for that. But um, that would that would be amazing. Um, but really, I think you're you generally will do just fine having a graphic novel section, and then everybody knows where it is, where to go. And it's such a uh, visual medium that having a browsing collection isn't a bad thing at all. Oh yeah, People will absolutely. will find what they're looking for that way. If there's any way that you can display some of your collection face out, it's a huge benefit because of the visual nature of them. They'll they'll circulate a lot more. I don't know if that answered your question at all, but <laughs> it's such an open-ended thing. It's really dependent on the uh, mm -hmm. the library and how you would like to set it up. Mm -hmm. um, does uh, Lindsay have any titles to add to the ones that you rattled off before about top five or? Did you have any, if any other titles that she was thinking of that you, maybe I'm, you didn't I'm put it on her head and she make her talk? Her. <laughs> She's running away. She's very shy. That's okay. Well, do you have any? I can, I can, I can uh, read them. And she said I mentioned most of the ones she would suggest. Okay. So cool. were there any that I didn't suggest that you can think of? There's got to be some. Our interests are. Oh yeah, duh. Scott Pilgrim. You get oh. Scott Pilgrim, <laughs> definitely. Um, for your, your teen collection. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, the movie was successful enough that yeah. that it's it's really three and a half people who are gonna check it out just because of the name recognition. But uh, it's also a, a fabulous, fabulous book for teens. Mm -hmm. The series is absolutely amazing. I believe I've had to replace my copies at least once already. <laughs> Um, which is good and bad, but <laughs> but you know they, they surf a lot, so definitely Scott Pilgrim. Um, but, uh, oh, and, yeah, she she does bring up a, an interesting an interesting thing. Um, you probably, if you don't have a graphic novel collection, you probably already have um, comics like uh, Calvin and Hobbes and Simpsons collections, things like that, in your collection, and are probably extremely successful. Um, those can uh, work fantastic in a, a graphic novel collection, as well as um, kind of easing people into a graphic novel collection if it's your new collection. And do a display, like um. if you liked Calvin and Hobbes, try this. You know, oh, yeah. They do that, that kind know, of thing in that. the... The, the bookstores all the time, you know. Yeah, it works. And well. that's just part so, of your, you know, reader's advisory, you know, same concept. Yeah, so really, if you're if you're um, if you're putting together a new graphic novel area, definitely, you know, utilize the, the resources that you you have in your your comics collections, like uh, your comic strip collections, like you know, Calvin and Hobbes and Garfield and, and you know, Peanuts, all that good stuff. Um, any other questions? I, I, I hope I'm um, answering your questions well. I, yeah. Um, um, nothing else at the moment? No. Looks like we've covered everyone's current questions. Um, 
If nobody yeah. has anything else, I think we can wrap it up. Anything else you guys want to say on your end? I just want to say uh, thank you for coming and, and listening to me rattle on. And I would, <laughs> well, like I, I said, I have the greatest mic voice in the world. But, oh, you're fine. <laughs> um, if if you do have any questions at all, um, I believe my email should be on the. Isn't it on the thing somewhere? On the on, sign up thing somewhere. Um, or we can put it on there if you want. Yes, it's not yeah, by default, but yeah, if sure. If you have any mm -hmm. questions, you can just shoot me an email. Yep, um, I'll put his. Or if uh, yeah. you want to read Lindsay's 400-page tome on the history of comics and graphic novels, <laughs> which is much more uh, in depth than what you've just seen, um, wow. you can email me, and I can pester her until she sends it to you. <laughs> or you can email her. Right? Would you be okay with them putting your email? On? Yeah, she says you can put her email. Up. Okay, I'll put both. Yeah, so when we put the recordings up, the recording up for this, we'll have contact information for both of you guys on there. Um, so if you do want to know any more. Um, yeah, like I said, this is very interesting for me. Like I said, I learned a lot of stuff that I uh, didn't know uh, about the history of it. Like I said, I've been reading for years. And I even found a few titles that I want to ask for Christmas possibly that Lost Girls one obviously and also Peach Fuzz sounded very interesting of ones that I haven't read yet. <laughs> um, yeah, Peach Fuzz is fun and Lost Girls is amazing. So yeah. <laughs> but, so. Uh, okay. Awkward confusion. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's okay. So um, we are going to wrap up for the day here and um, for the morning. And um, as I said, this has been recorded, so we'll have the recording up uh, later today, tomorrow, for everyone to watch. And like I said, with the contact information, um, will be included as well. And we hope you will join us next week when um, our session will be on Ferber, for all you catalogers out there, where uh, Emily Nimsikant, the cataloging librarian here at the Commission, will talk a little a bit about Ferber and how you get into doing that for your cataloging. So I uh, hope to see you again next week. Thanks very much, Gordon and Lindsay, and thanks everyone for coming. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now.